we were considering a database and I'm going to try to sketch it real quick based on what we had and it'll be your job to tell me if I forgot something or, or, or whatever. The idea was that we were doing a, a summer league for baseball, softball, possibly other sports, and we defined that there would be a league table, an age range table, a sport table. These would have a one-to-many relationship with league table, meaning one sport can have many leagues, but a given league is only for one sport. So it's not like within the same league they're going to be playing baseball and softball and golf. If it's a baseball league, they play baseball. Likewise, with age range, one league has one age range, but a given age range can have multiple leagues because there could be a baseball and a softball league for the same, um, same age range. All right. We then, if I remember right, coming from that, we had teams players coaches and after lengthy discussion, this one was easy one league can have many teams a given team is only in one league though coaches to teams, we said it was a many to many because one coach could coach many teams. They could coach their son and daughter's team. And one team has more than one coach. And we decided that there would be a one-to-many relationship between players. We, I made an executive decision and said that a player can only belong to one team in this summer league. So, actually, I actually looked up league rules. Pardon me? I said I actually looked up league rules. Right, right. Um, are we missing any entities? Sponsors. I was going to say, I thought there was one because I remember the diagram having something over here. And that's right, it was sponsors. And what did we say on that? We said many to many, right? I think. It could go either way. But yeah, we said it could go either way, but we decided on something. We'll say we decided on many to many. I think that was part of the decision why I made players one to many was because we already had a couple many to many's. All right. These diagrams can get more involved, by the way. I usually keep them simple like this. I'm interested in the cardinality of the relationship and so on. But there's actually other things that you, you can consider. For example, if a relationship is required or not. All right. Um, you could have. Everything out there would be required except sponsors, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of, of a, of a, of a not. yeah. Well, we'll yeah, we'll say everything but sponsors. That would be a good one to do it. You could do, and again, different notations show different ways. Sometimes they put a one up here indicating it's required, or maybe they do that. I think that. Yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. And I think they put a zero here, an O there, if it's not required. So, like, for example, you could have, you know, team doesn't have to have a sponsor. You know. So there's more that you can put in these diagrams. And then there's things like um, becoming mandatory. All right, that would be, for instance, maybe, like as you sign up, maybe you don't belong to a team, all right? You sign up for Little League Baseball, you don't belong to a team initially, but eventually you will get assigned to a team, and that would be becoming mandatory. In other words, that relationship becomes mandatory at some point, but initially, you need to be able to put in a player without a team associated with them. 
And you can think of that in, in, in like an employee department relationship. You may hire an employee before you quite know where to put that employee. You know, you might hire a bunch of people to work for, for holiday seasons in a retail store. And you may not be really sure right off the bat who, you know, what department people are going to get assigned to. But by the time they actually, like, finish their training and so on, you know, you will assign them to a department. So there's a lot of other information that you can put in here. And I encourage you to check that out and, and to, again, you, there's documentation on this. But I like to kind of keep it simple because really the main thing is d discovering the nature of the relationships. To put it again, um, the relationships, you have to look going in both directions. The error that I see many students make is only looking in one direction. So they might say, well, the sport can have many leagues. Okay, that's a many-to-many -many relationship. No, it doesn't work that way. One sport can have many leagues, that's true, but a given league is only going to have one sport. There are times when you do have to use what I would say common sense, all right? It does not make sense for a league to have multiple sports in it, all right? This week the Browns are going to play the Jaguars, but it's going to be in rugby, all right, instead of football. And, and the week after that they're going to play soccer. Yeah, that actually would be kind of cool in a way, but that's but not how it works. Don't jinx it. Don't jinx it. Yeah, yeah, we're not going to change it. That's not how it works, you know, typically. However, some things aren't necessarily common sense, or if they are common sense, you ought to verify them. For example, the relationship between teams and sponsors. If you think that through, you really could see that going either way. Likewise, the relationship between teams and players. Potentially, that could go the other way. And that's where you have to talk to the actual organization, the, the, the subject matter experts, the experts of the pro, uh, problem domain, to determine, hey, in your league, is a player allowed to play on more than one team? And it's yes or no. Do remember that, how do I want to say it? Sometimes you have to, and, and, and I'm using this word on purpose, but sometimes you have to interrogate the user. All right. I don't mean shine a flashlight on them or shine a big spotlight on them and all that. Yeah, no, 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 none of that kind of stuff. But sometimes you have to dig a little and ask questions. And almost like they do on personality tests, you ever see those where they ask kind of like the same question two or three ways to see if they get the same answer? All right. Sometimes you have to do that just to, to confirm and to be sure. Because it could be that 90% of the kids are only signed up to one team. So you talk to the person in the, in the Parks and Recreation office, and oh yeah, every player is only on one team. But then you, you know, if you come up with scenarios, or you ask and dig a little further, or ask to see their Excel spreadsheets, or whatever, you might find that, oh, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, 90% of the kids do, but there's the extra 10% that, that don't. So you have to sometimes kind of have to dig a little. I've heard, um, I've heard that with software development, there are the two biggest problems are this. The first biggest problem is not listening to what your users have to say. The second problem is listening to what your users have to say. All right? In other words, you take what they say, but you also apply your own expertise and you also dig a little to see if what they're saying is consistent and makes sense and, and uh, if there's any loopholes. People aren't used to thinking in database terms, all right? People in the civilians, you know, people in the outside world, not IT people. They're not used to thinking in that. So if 90% of the players think uh, are, are only on one team, uh, a, a user is likely, likely to say, yeah, players only on one team. Not realizing that you have to build your database to encompass all possibilities. So if it is possible, then you have to address it. The other thing I would say, again, is depending on the problem, it's valuable to talk to people um, at different levels of the organization because they bring different perspectives to it. All right? Um, 
people on people in quote management or upper management know what they want to get out of the system know what results they want know what information they need to perform their jobs correctly all right people on the I'll say clerical end of things, the operational end of things, need to get through their work day and handle all the situations that are coming across their desk. Those are two completely different viewpoints of the world and the data. All right? And a system that's designed for one group versus, an, versus the other group, if it's, ex, if it's designed exclusively for one group as opposed to the other group, then there's going to be issues with it. All right? The clerical people lack maybe the bigger picture of why we're developing this and what management hopes to get out of it. The management lacks the um, practical day-to-day -day in the trenches knowledge. It's amazing if you talk to managers and employees to hear managers' perspective on what they think their employees do. All right. Sometimes it's not grounded in reality or it's not completely grounded in reality and they don't necessarily know the particular issues that they face and so on. So you want to talk to several people, you want to talk across the organization. All right. Getting more into the nuts and bolts uh, of this, I think we said last time that we would have something like this in the age range table. We would have an age range ID and would have a description. And one thing I thought about, minimum and maximum age. Or maybe just a maximum age because we said people could play up a level. All right, but minimum to maximum. All right. So maybe age range one is 10 to 12. Min is 10, max is 12, and so on down the line. Sport, we said, would probably have a code, an ID, and would have a description. Now, I said that the primary key to these things is what uniquely identifies the fields, the, the, the members of the entity, the rows in the table, if you will. And I said we could use, for example, in this case, a description of the sport. There's only going to be baseball in there once, right? But I said we're going to pick sport ID. Why do I pick sport ID instead of the full description as a primary key? Because you ever had a sport. I, I could, if I added a third sport, tennis, that would be fine. It would still be unique. Well, in case you wanted to change the description and all that, right? right. You could, like, uh, not in this particular case, but in other cases you would. That's a possibility. One thing about primary keys that you want is you want primary keys to not change that often. IDs are easier to use. And why are IDs easier to use? All right. Well, you're, you're dealing with a yeah, number. From a processing standpoint, you're dealing with less, less bytes of information. Right, and that, that's a big one as well. Both the things that you said are true. Um, you can store much more data in a numeric field than in an alphanumeric field. All right. So keep in, keep in mind that this code is not just going to be in the sports table, but it's going to be in any table related to the sports table as a foreign key. We talked about foreign keys last time. So therefore, um, if we were going to have a field, um, you know, it, it's to our benefit to have a numeric field because you'll take up less space. A dramatic example of that is if we were storing automobiles, right? What is a unique field associated with an automobile? A serial number, right, or VIN number. How big are VIN numbers? They're gigantic. They're 20-some characters. All right. So if I was running a car rental agency and I was going to make the primary key to my, my, my car table a VIN number, does it fit the qualifications of a primary key? Yeah. It's unique 
Every vehicle has one. So, yeah, we, we could do that. But the point is, is that's a lot of extra characters would have to store, not just in the automobile table, but in any table that links to the automobile table. Would have to store that VIN number, which would be a giant field. So for that reason, we, it would be, would be better off using uh, a, uh, um, um, a, an auto number field, which the database simply generates a sequential number. Most <coughs> databases have that facility. Now, if you're thinking this through, you might say, well, if we don't make the serial number a primary key, what's keeping us from having two cars that have the same serial number if it's not the primary key? Well, we can create an index on that field, and we can create a non-unique, or uh, I'm sorry, a unique index on it, all right? And that will prevent um, duplications for being uh, from being happening. So anytime you have more than one field that could be the primary key, those are called candidate keys. All right? Um, and you have to pick one. You're not going to make all of them the primary key. That's, that's overkill. One of the rules of a good primary key is that it's minimal. All right? So you're not going to store... You know, for a student ID, I'm not going to store, I'm not going to make the primary key of that the student ID and the student zip code combination, right? Because the student ID itself uniquely identifies the student. So one of the rules is that it's minimal, all right? Another thing is it's good if it doesn't change. It's not an absolute requirement, but that's a good one. You don't want it changing too often because that sort of complicates things. And numbers as opposed to characters, smaller is better than bigger. And for all those reasons, we're going to probably use a lot of auto number keys, which are, again, are keys that are fields that are automatically generated. All right, we talked about the league table. And there's a one-to-many relationship between age range and league, and also sport to league. All right. How do we implement that? How do we implement a one-to-many relationship? DRD. Yeah, we've shown it in DRD, but when I create the tables, how do I associate, how do I establish that relationship between age range and league? You need like a joining table? Is that what you're looking for? Do I need a joining table? No, yeah, not there. No, not in this case. Well, and if you used, was it access? That is true. But in all relational databases, the concept is the same. So the mechanism that you do it in access is one way. That's true. Use and, a foreign key. And you use a foreign key. What does a foreign key mean? It's not linking to, it's feeding off the primary key of another table. All right. It's an attribute in one table that points to the primary key of another table. Now, where am I going to put that attribute? Am I going to put it to establish the relationship between age range and league? Am I going to put something in the age range table, or am I going to put it in the league table? League table. I'm going to put it in the league table. Remember, the many side can always point to the one. All right? So I might have a league ID, primary key, a league name, and a age range ID. And finally, a sport ID. All right. These being foreign keys. Now, what makes them foreign keys varies. Or, or how do I want to put this? How you create this as a foreign key relationship varies from database platform to database platform. But... One thing is absolutely true. Simply having a column in here called age range ID does not make that a foreign key. You have to establish the relationship. You have to connect those fields. Remember, in a relational database, we're storing data about multiple entities, which we're doing, and we're storing the relationship between those entities. So we have to explicitly say, this field here 
relates to the primary key of that table. And that's what establishes the foreign key relationship. With the foreign key relationship, you get what is called referential integrity. That simply means that I can't put something in here that doesn't match up with something in there. So, if my age, grade, age range IDs are 1 through 4, and my sports IDs are 1 and 2, I could not put in <coughs> this row in the database with an age range ID of 5 and a sport ID of 3. Why? Because it doesn't match up with anything over there. I, I, I just, I can't do it. It's not like a case of it's a bad idea to do it or whatever. If I've established that relationship correctly, the database engine simply will not allow me to put that in. Which is exactly what we want it to do, right, if you think about it. Because if we were to put that in, then and we were going to run a report to see how many kids were in uh, a certain age range or whatever, we'd get some bogus results here because who knows what age range 5 is and who knows what sport ID of 3 is, right? And it doesn't match up. So we would get garbage output data if we were to do this. So referential integrity means that this and this have to match up with their respective primary key fields. Now, not in this case, but it could be possible to enter a row in that didn't have a value for the foreign key. All right. Again, it doesn't really make sense in this particular context. All right. But let's say we had some family all ages softball league. Bring everyone. Bring your newborn, bring, gra bring grandma, and they can all play on the team. So there really was no age range associated with that. <clears throat> you could have a blank in that field. And not really a blank, but a null. All right? And that's legit. That doesn't violate referential integrity. All right? If you do have something in there, though, it has to match up with something in the age range table. So that's acceptable. This is not. That's acceptable, but you'd still be better off creating another age ID of just whatever, right? I disagree with that. Oh, really? okay. um, so for example, you're saying to cre I could create an age category of 1 to 99 or something like that. Well, the, the problem is there with that is, well, what happens if a 100-year-old person comes to play? Okay, I can make it 1 to 200 then. Well, I a three-month-old wants, wants to come play. Pardon me? A three-month-old. Well, if a three-month-old wants to come and play. Yeah, exactly. Really... It's not a good idea, and, and this is this is one of Zeller's law. Um, you guys should you guys should form a, a a Twitter account and tweet Zeller's law from time to time. Hashtag it with that. But one of Zeller's law is don't lie to your database. All right. And here's the reason why. Let's let's extend this thinking a little bit. Really, in this case, this hypothetical league that accepts anyone has no age range. There's no restriction based on age range. To put a dummy value in then, sort of clouds the issue. Let me give you an example. And I've run into this millions of times. Okay, hundreds of thousands of times. I don't want to exaggerate. Whereas in a system, they put dummy values in the tables that means something else. For example, I worked for a car rental company, and we had 300 and some branches. So a branch of, you know, one was Cleveland, two was Detroit, three was 
Indianapolis, and so on down the line. They made it so that branch 999 meant something special. I forget what. I, I think a branch of 999 meant that we were trying to sell a car at auction. All right? Or something like that. And we had certain codes, like in the 900s, that were in the branch table, but they really weren't branches. The problem is, if, if I want to get a report of car by branches, I have to be smart enough to exclude those cars in the 900s, because those aren't really branches. They're branches, they're, they're ways of categorizing, categorizing a car that we're disguising it as a branch number. So let's say 999 was the code for a car being at auction. You know, we're selling the car. It would be better off to keep it in the branch that it was at and simply put a one character, is this car at auction? And then you could run queries and look for it, cars that are at auction, cars that are not auction, cars of the branch, and you wouldn't corrupt the data. So data should mean one thing, all right? If this, is a, if this is an age range table, we should really have age range in there and not a dummy age range that indicates there is no age range. Okay, so how would you run a report to get all the uh, players that are in the uh, unspecified age range? Like they're in these that... that don't Where age range equals null. Where age range is null. Okay, that's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. Um, so, you know, you, you see that a lot in old legacy sort of applications. Um, back in the old days, as we know from the Y2K problem, people were very cognizant of resources and storage and all that. So, hey, if we can save two bytes on every date, woohoo, you know, we're not going to use up our 30 meg hard drive, all right, too quickly. But, and so people did all kinds of goofy stuff like that. In another application I worked in, customer 999 was not really a customer, but it was just a miscellaneous customer. Just someone that didn't, didn't buy regularly from us, but was placing an order. And there was, and then every program we have was littered with, if 999 then treat this special and otherwise don't treat it special. And one of the problem with that is what happens if one of those programs gets it wrong? So don't lie to your database. Don't put dummy values in or anything like that. The field should represent that. What I want to do now is I want to take a break from the theoretical design discussion. The last thing we sort of have outstanding here is this many-to-many -many relationship. Let's talk about what would be in the teams table to start. What would be in the team's table? Well, it would probably be a team's ID, team, team name, and what? Coach. Coach. Coach IDs. Well, what happens if they have more than one coach ID? That's where you need the joining table. That's where you need the joining table. So there wouldn't be Actually, I lied. We'll talk about many-to-many -many relationships now. In this case, we have a many-to-many -many relationship, which means that if we have a coach table here, coach ID of one is Joe Smith. Coach ID of two is Mary Jones. So this is where you'd have to set a rule, though, and say one team can only have so many coaches. Because your table, you don't want to put ten blanks. You can never guess how many coaches could absolutely be there. Right. So you would want to say, okay, well, you can only have a maximum of five, and it'll only have five. Wrong. 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 Because what happens if there is a six person that they want to have? Well, that's what I mean. You'd have to set a rule saying there can only be so many. Well, why don't they change that rule next year? Then they can pay me to change the deck. <laughs> because right. I didn't think you would want, because in, like, the, the coach's table that joins those, you wouldn't want, like, Coach ID to have one, comma two, comma three, comma four, comma five, comma to represent which coach. Well, we're not going to have that. Yeah. All right, we'll 
we'll see how we're going to do that, but we're not, we're not going to have what you described. All right, so coach ID of one is Joe Smith, coach ID of two is Mary Jones, and coach ID of three is Sue Fields. All right, so let's say we have team one, which is the Yankees, and team two, which is the Marlins. I don't know why I picked those. Let's say Joe and Mary coach the Yankees. Sue and Mary coach the Marlins. Okay. Can I have a coach ID field here? You could, but with duplicate with more than one coach, you would have more than one piece of data per. Well, yeah, you're on the right track, but if I wanted to do this, I'd have to put three slots, four yeah. slots, five slots. How many are the maximum number of coaches? Well, I don't know. Six. All right, maybe we make a rule, but again, that could change. Remember, in database terms, there's three numbers only, zero, one, and many. All right? So there isn't such a thing as a one to six relationship, all right? There's a one or a six to six or whatever. There's a many to many. So therefore, if I put three slots in here for coach ID, which I could do, the problem is, is what happens if I need a fourth coach on this? I have to go and revise the database structure. That's a big deal. Changing the database structure is a big deal. It's changing the foundation of the application that you've created. It's not painting the walls or putting wallpaper up or changing the carpet, something like small and cosmetic that can fairly easily be accomplished. It's changing the foundation and saying, hmm, we want a, this building to be three floors instead of two floors. Okay, I realize that isn't changing the foundation, but you get the idea. It's a major change. So, we don't want to put this in for two reasons. First of all, there could always be one more. All right? Second of all, is it's going to make queries real difficult. Because if I want to see all the teams that Joe coaches, I have to look in three different spots. Because maybe Joe would be put here in this team, and here in this team, and here in this team. And it's going to make it difficult. You could say, why not put 100 slots for coaches? Anything more than 100 is absurd. Well, no, that's, that's not a solution. So I can't have one because they have more than one coach. <clears throat> I can't try anything odd like try to stuff in a series of fields separated by commas there because that makes things very difficult as well. Then you have to do... Um, some custom programming to break that out and parse it, and that, that's a mess as well. But one coach ID can't point to more than one coach. And we have the exact opposite problem from coach to team. One coach, I can't put a team ID in the coach because one coach can coach many teams. Which team's ID do you put in? This is where we have what is called an intersecting entity. It's a table that matches up the two other entities. So, many to many relationships can't stand. They can't be implemented in a relational database directly. They have to be broken down into a couple one-to-many relationships. So you're never going to have that in a finalized database. You can always break it down to this. And then what is the, what is the, um, what is contained in this table? Well, we have a coach ID and a team ID. And what's the primary key to this table? Neither. Well, both. Both. Both, yeah. Yeah, it could be done a couple different ways, but 
In this example, we'll say both of them taken together. Which makes sense, right? Because someone can coach more than one team, but someone isn't two times a coach for the same team. If they're a coach for the team, they're a coach for the team. Uh, two times coach. Yeah. So I said Joe coaches the Yankees. So I'd have coach one coaches the Yankees. Mary also coaches the Yankees. So coach ID of two coaches the Yankees. Then I said that Mary also coaches the Marlins. So two coaches two. And Sue coaches the Marlins. Now both of these together form the primary key. And when we have two fields together forming the primary key, the combination has to be unique. So we don't have any duplicate combinations there. We have duplicate coach IDs and we have duplicate team IDs, but we don't have duplicate combinations of coach and team. All right? In addition, rule of a primary key is every row has to have a value for it. And if it's multiple part, it has to have value for each part of it. Well, we're not going to have a row in this table that's going to be missing a coach ID or missing a team ID. That doesn't make any sense. Here we got a coach for the Yankees, but <coughs> it's not connected to someone in our coach table. That doesn't make sense. All right. So we have very much a formula once you have the ERD. That's, that, in my mind, is the good news about database design, is that we very much have a formula. A one-to-many relationship is always implemented by having a foreign key on the many side that points to the one side. Always. A many-to-many -many relationship is always implemented by having an intersecting table between the two of them. So the coach is the, 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 co or the coach ID. I didn't think a primary key could point to a primary key. Well, it's pointing to part of a primary key. Oh, okay. This part is pointing to, remember, in this table, both these are the primary keys, so it's pointing to the part of the primary key. Okay. So in that way, in fact, there's even software that does this for you. If you draw an entity relationship diagram and establish the relationships correctly, it'll go and generate the database tables. Why? Because this is a mechanical process. All right? It's, you know, it, the, the tough part is getting to this diagram. Once you've gotten to that diagram, implementing it in a table is relatively easy. All right. Here's what I would like to do now. Any questions about this? And we'll come, we'll come back to this and, and, and so on. Here's, yeah, this is, this is uh, CIS has 143, eight weeks worth of it. That is just about yeah. minus one or two homework assignments. Right. Now, notice I never said normalization rules here. But I did kind of talk about the normalization rules. What are the normalization rules? The normalization rules, think of them as like a checklist to make sure that your database design is, is reasonable. Doesn't mean that it's correct, all right? But it, it, it's sort of considered to be like the spell check of database design, the normalization rules. If you have a problem, if you're violating the normalization rules, then you need to change something. If you have not violated it, it doesn't mean you're perfect, and we'll, we'll get to that um, in a minute. First normalization rule says every entity is in a table. You don't have more than one entity in a table, and every entity has a primary key. Well, we have all primary keys up there. All right. The other part of the first rule is that there are no repeating fields. No repeating fields. What are repeating fields? That would be if we had coach, coach, coach in here. What's the problem with the repeating fields? Well, we already covered that. How do I know that three is the proper number of coaches to have? <coughs> and if I do have three, 
um, all my queries are going to be much more complicated. So no, no repeating fields. Second normalization rule says what? I get, between, I get confused between the second and third normalization rule. Says that a field should depend on part of the primary key. What does that mean? Well, let's say I stuff the word Yankees in here, in this table. All right. What does Yankees depend on? Does it depend on the coach? A lot of money. Does it depend on the team? It's the team. Sorry. It depends on the team ID. The, the, the team name depends on the team ID. In other words, I have Joe and Mary, right? And they're going to coach this team today. Joe is not going to be coaching the Yankees and Mary coaching the Mets, right? They're coaching the same team. So the team name is not really an attribute of the coach in the team. In other words, for different coaches, you don't have different names for the same team. But it simply depends on what team you're talking about. So that's the second normalization rule. The third normalization rule is that a key or a field should not depend on a non-key field. So for example, if I had sport name here, what's wrong with that? Well, sport name depends on not the specific league, it depends on the sport ID that you're talking about, not the league. If we've identified this as a sport ID of one, we know it's baseball. There's no reason to have it baseball here. If I do that, I'm liable to run the risk of saying that this has a sport ID of one and is a bowling league. And that doesn't make any sense, right? If it's sport one, it's baseball. We can study these normalization rules, but really what we're doing is we're making sure we put the attribute where it really belongs. All right? We know repeating fields are bad for all the reasons it builds in unnecessary restrictions into the database. These things are bad because we're introducing redundant data. Hey, we already got the team name and the team table, or we should have the team in the team table. Therefore, we don't need it in the coach team table. We already have the sport name in the sport table, therefore we don't need it. The whole purpose of databases, relational databases, is to eliminate redundancy. So if we have redundancy, that's a problem, and there can be inconsistencies. All right. I'm sure we'll come back more on database design going forward, but let's do the fun stuff now. Let's go and let's make a web page that reads a table. So I'm going to make just the league table for lack of um, uh, what table do I want to make? I'll make the make the I don't know. I'll make the sports table, the real simple table. Actually, I'll try to, <laughs> I'll make the sports age range and team table. That should be enough to keep us busy for a while. <coughs> so I'm going to go into Microsoft Access. You don't have to use Access. If you want to use SQL Server, you're welcome to. Are we going to be doing SQL? Well, it's assumable that we'll probably be doing SQL statements, right? Yeah. In what time is it now? 11.07. By 11.15. <laughs> well, uh, maybe 11.20. Yeah. All right. So where is access? Just start typing in. Just start typing. Here you go. No, no, you're good. Can I turn one of these lights off? Yeah. I'm going to create a blank desktop database. And I'm going to put it on my desktop. And I'm going to call it Summer Leagues. 
does it all, just like images and things like that, does that all have to be within the same folder, the website? We'll see where we're going to put it in, in, in a second. There's a couple ways to refer, refer to a database. We're going to do the simple way, mm -hmm. all right, um, and we'll probably talk about the other way um, later on in the course. All right, so please take the time to give things proper names. That's a really bad habit to get into when, for example, I see a class called Class 1 or something like that. What's going to happen when you build an application and you have 68 classes? Oh, yeah, Class 47, that was the, as you're going to drive yourself crazy. So I'm going to go here, I'm going to create the database. And it gives you a table for free, all right, because it figures, hey, why, why would you make a database and not have a table? That's stupid, all right? We're not going to use this method of creating it. This is strictly a, you know, for, for people that aren't really familiar with databases. We're going to go into design view. And I'm going to give the table a name. And again, it's going to be a descriptive name. Let's call it sport. Cleverly enough. And sport ID is the primary key. See, it knows that you, you probably want a primary key, so it makes a field called primary key. I typically like to call the primary key the table name ID. You don't absolutely have to, but it really helps in keeping things straight. The data type is auto number, which means that it will be simply generated for you. You don't have to create the auto numbers. The database will assign them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If you delete something, it doesn't go back and reuse the number, but that's okay because you're not going to run out of numbers. All right? Remember, this is what's called a surrogate key. A surrogate key is it doesn't really mean anything. It's just there to establish the linkage. We don't, it, it's not like that's, you know, uh, some standard number that baseball is sport number one in some ANSI standard list of sport names. Pay attention to the data types. All right. Got to change the field size to save them bytes. Well, we don't know how big it is. It probably st stores it as a variable length, so we, we're probably okay. That's a maximum length. Now, I'm going to go and I'm going to make a required. So pay attention to this metadata. <coughs> Remember that. In addition to storing the actual data in the database, we store data about the database, such as what the key is, if it's a required field, and so on. So therefore, set those. Now, sports name better be unique in this table, right? I should not have two entries that are called baseball. The way that you can do that is by saying I want this to be indexed and no duplicates. So that will be creating a unique index so that I cannot put baseball in twice. All right. That just about does it for this table. I can close this table. Do I want to save? Yep. Now when I double click on it, now I can enter data. And notice again, I don't have to put anything in the sport ID. It's going to generate it for me. So I can put in baseball and softball. Notice that if I try to save it, without adding something, it, it's not going to work. And if I try to put softball in twice, it gives me an error. The change you requested to the table were not successful because they would create duplicate values in the index primary key or relationship. Blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to go and delete. The hat. You're going to delete softball out. You're going to have to yeah, clear something. Yeah. Gotcha. And then delete it. We don't oh. know what stinks about doing that. What? Because sport ID 3 is gone now. 
And as I mentioned before, you're concerned that you are going to run out of numbers. No. I like my numbers in ascending order, not disappearing order. It's slight like OCD and all that. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I can use it. I'm the same way. Uh, when, I was in, when I was in database design, like I would sit there and redo tables so I could get ID numbers back. <laughs> it's just a little OCD. I'm wow. Ready. I'm ready. The only time that that would really matter if you're talking something like a check number, whereas like a missing check number, yeah, that's kind of a big deal, right? You know. I just like to save bytes, okay? I like to save bytes. I don't know how that saves bytes, but that's okay. You're not hurting anyone, so you're only taking up your own time. So if you need to do that, that's fine. I have a 10 megabyte hard drive. All right. Let me go in and add another table. So I'll go to create table. Go into design view, and this one is what? Age range. <coughs> and I can put in age range. ID. I can put in what? I can put in the description. Keep in mind that there are certain words that have a meaning to within SQL and access, and you don't want to call your fields that because it will save trouble. DESC is one of them. Access warning lets you name it that way. Oh, oh, oh. oh, yeah. Oh. DESC is actually for descending. So if you're doing sorting by descending order, like the highest to the lowest. Um, you would use DESC in your SQL statement. So it's good to avoid it. It's also good to avoid spaces in the name. I'm going to make this required. And I am going to make it a unique index. Can you leave it as short text? To what? Uh, to numbers. Numeric. Now the description is going to be text, so it'll be something like 10-12. Yeah, yeah, so the lower limit is going to be a number, and the upper limit will be a number. Now, it might be that there is no upper limit on the team. Maybe there is like an 18 and over softball league. In which case, I'm not going to make these fields required. All right. Okay. So that's the age range table. Let's go in and save this. And let's enter in a couple of age ranges. 10 and 11. Lower limit 10. Upper limit 11. 12 to 13, lower limit 12. Now, are you putting in the lower and upper for validation of some sort? Like oh, that? I'm putting in that just in case I wanted to see, for example, what league someone was eligible for. Okay. So I could, I could do that. All right, two of these are enough for now. Let's go in and create another table. And this is the league table, if I am correct. And league ID. Okay, name it doesn't let me do. Yeah, I knew there was something that they didn't let you use. I'm not even sure if it, I think it just kind of warned me there uh -huh. that, hey, you're setting yourself up for trouble if you do that. But if your heart is set on it, go ahead. Now, what do I need here? IDs. I need the ID. So I need the sport ID. And that's going to be a type number. It's not an auto number in this table. In other words, it's automatically generated in the sport table. But this one, we're going to assign the sport that this belongs to. And we need the age range ID number. 
with the lead name, do you want to set the properties? Yeah, we should set the properties of the lead name to be required and to be indexed with the unique index. And sport ID, I want to be required. And age range ID, I want to be required. The more constraints that you can put on the database, the better off you are, because that is going to be prohibiting bad data from getting in. So if I forgot to put, to, to make the, the league name a required field, then I could put in just an empty league. Or if I made a, a league and I didn't make the <coughs> age uh, range ID required or the sports ID required, then I could put garbage data in. I could put a league that wasn't associated with any sport. And as we know, by definition, that doesn't make any sense. All right. So let's go and let's add some data. to this. So we'll say the little league. Ah, no, we're not going to add data to this. Sorry. Right, there goes user ID 1. <laughs> they should really change that tone to something that you want to hear <laughs> rather than something you don't want to hear. What's the purpose of it, though? I know you don't want to hear it. <laughs> I got, every time when I was in database course, every time I heard that, I wanted to throw my Apple computer out the window. <laughs> I don't think it matters how nice they make it. It's uh, some bad adventure. This is it's like <laughs> it's like you develop a Pavlovian response to that. Every time you hear that, like if, if someone were to play that in the hall, you'd you'd probably be flinching, you know. What and what did I forget to do that I need to do now? I need to define relationships. Now, didn't I define relationships by putting in those two fields in no, this table? No. No. You have to tell them. I have to tell it that that really is a relationship. Now, you might think, gee, I call it the same thing. Doesn't matter. All right. So, under database tools, relationships. Why do we, why do I, def, why do I define relationships before I put data in? Yeah, to make sure that I don't enter in some bogus data. So right now, and I'll do it just to demonstrate, and we'll waste another auto number. <laughs> He's doing it on purpose now. See? Yeah. <laughs> See? Delete it. Start over. Delete the whole thing. Now two is gone too. There goes two. I could put in with a sport ID and an age range ID of that. And that's clearly, there's no such sport ID of 44 and no such age range ID of it. So I'll go and delete that. <laughs> all right, this is going to be fun. It's not me that's mad. It's going to be all the, like, uh, the dads that are there rooting for their dads, sons in little, little league that can't be number one anymore. But you will not, you, no one will ever see that league ID. There's no reason to put that league ID anywhere visible. And, and that's the point. Okay. Exactly. They'll know. Relate, yeah. There's a, there's relationship. Even in a printout, it's not going to show. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to establish the relationship. How do I do that? I drag the field from one to another. I want to click on enforce referential integrity. If you don't click on Enforce Referential Integrity, you really didn't do anything. That should be like defaulted to Enforce Referential Integrity. No, you don't always need it. 95% of the time. You don't I, I am going to pretend I didn't hear that. <laughs> There's only one occasion where you do not need to enforce Referential Integrity. So why are you backing me up then if you want to pretend I didn't say that? Because <laughs> there are, let's put it this way. If we're going to take the ratio of that, given that there is an infinitude of cases where we would want to, and there's one case where we would not want to, that number is approaching zero. And for all practical purposes, that number is zero. 
So you do want to uh, check this. So my point is they should default that to enforce referential integrity, is what it says. Keep in mind that this is not a pro tool, and that's why they don't do that. Now, I've heard people say this relationship is wrong. All right, it drew it wrong. No. It knows the nature of the relationship. It knows that sport, that league is on the many side because sport ID points to the one. So if that relationship is wrong, then you designed it wrong. It didn't get it wrong. Because I've had people ask, how do I make that go the other direction? It's like, you don't. You create the relationship the right way and it will go the right direction. Okay, we're not going to talk about Cascade right now. We're going to leave those off. So now, if I go in the league, and I put in Little League, <laughs> now this one, it won't let us. If I put in nonsense for that, it will tell me that you cannot add or change a record because a related record is required in the table sport. So I'll go and make this one, and make that one, and I'm okay. So I'll put in the next one, uh, what would be a... After a little, I don't know, I only know Babe Ruth, I think they call or something like that, or like... Babe Ruth. I don't know, well, it doesn't really matter. It's no not, ponies? <laughs> it's, not, it's not like we're going to be audited by the... Like Baseball Kegger. Association. That's Kegger League after the league. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was gonna do I was gonna do Bush League, but I was gonna spell Bush like the bear, you know, B-U-S-C-H. All right, so we got a couple leagues here. All right. So now, and this is taking a little longer than I thought, but now I want to go in. And I want to create an application that's going to list all of my leagues. All right. So I can close out of that. And I'm going to create, go into Visual Studio. File, new, website. Empty website, C sharp, and so on. I'm going to put it on the desktop, and I'm going to call it. Can you click on local IIS real quick? I want to see what that's default. To. Where? What? Oh, what go back to browse real quick. I just want to see what yours says, and then local ISS underneath file system. Okay, just one. Okay, and we'll call it Summer Sports. Should have named it Sports. We could just add a table for what season it is. <laughs> I actually like that comment. That's very true. <laughs> yep. Hey, there's snowboarding in the ski club. All right. So now we're going to go and we're going to create a page that reads the league table. I'm going to do this though first. I'm going to create a folder called app data. App app underscore data. That has a special meaning and for security reasons it's good if our database is in there. So I'm going to put my database within the app data folder. So it's underneath my app. If you remember, you did something similar when you worked on the custom classes. You had an app underscore code table. All right. So we're going to do app data. Close out of here. Get back in. Refresh. All right, there we go. Now, I'm going to go in and create a new web page. Now, I'm not going to go through the <coughs> excuse me. I'm not going to go through the process of creating a master page and so on. You know how to do that and you should do that. 
all right, as you're doing these assignments, to, for one thing to practice, for another thing we're likely to build on these and you're going to want a consistent look to your pages. So I'll go to File, Web Form, place code in, separate file, Visual C Sharp, and now, What we have to do is remember back to what we did with the site map and the menus and the tree view last time. We created a data source. We created a site map XML file. All right. That's the data. We created a visual component like a menu or a tree view or the breadcrumbs. We then bound the data together and we said this visual element, this visual component, gets its data from this data source. That's a nice little thing of keeping things independent. We can then use the same data source for multiple visual things and so on and so forth. All right? Just a good way of, again, continuing the theme of keeping stuff separate. So what we're going to do is we're first going to add our data source and it's a SQL data source and this is the data this is not the visual aspect of it so there's nothing really visual about this so I'm going to go drag that on the page configure data source we have to establish a connection to the database all right I can go and pick that in the drop down. Because it finds it in its own folder. Because it finds right? it in the app data folder. Next. Do I want to save this in the application configuration file? Yes, I do. We only want the stuff to be stored in one place. So let's imagine that I'm writing this for an access database. You know, something that's meant for you know, a handful of users to access it simultaneously. Then my city or my organization or whatever like blows up and I have lots of people accessing my database and I have to migrate it somewhere else. If you've done this correctly, you should only have to change the connection string in the config file to point to the new database, whether it be a SQL Server database or an Oracle database or any other database. All right? And everything else should work. So I'm going to go and say next. I then have to specify what data I want from it. Now, because we're going into overtime here, because I missed class Thursday, I'm going to talk twice as long today. So I hope you guys clear your afternoon. All right. Because, though, I'm a little pressed for time, I'm going to let you guys do the easy way of this. And I'm going to say we want from the league table the league ID, league name, sport, and sport ID. Notice as we are doing that, it is generating a select statement. Yes, a statement of when we're creating a SQL. I was off by a few minutes. It's 11.31 and we're creating a SQL statement. We could have typed this in. In fact, normally I do. And believe me, next time we definitely will. Is that what you wanted us to do? And you said we do it the easy way instead? This is the easy way, yeah. So I click Next. I can test my query to make sure everything is lined up correctly. And sure enough, yeah, that query looks like it's right. And then I can finish. So now I have a SQL data source. That is just the data. Let's look at the app data. I'm sorry, let's look at the web config file. And we will see that there is a connection string we saved. So the first time you create a connection string for an application, you create the connection string. Each subsequent time, when we come back on Thursday, we are not going to create a new connection string. We're simply going to use that one. Why? Because if anything changes, 
All I have to do is change the value in this XML file. So we have the data source. I now want the visual part of it. And we're going to, the, the first visual control we're going to look at is called a grid view. A grid view is a table of data. It's meant, it's, it's meant to show multiple rows, uh, multiple rows and columns of data. All right, it's going to translate to an HTML table. Choose data source. Well, the data source we just defined. And notice now it's smart enough to know, hey, that's the columns that I'm returning in the data source. So if I go and run this, we get a listing of those two fields from, or two rows from the lead database. Now, if I go in, and again, this is dynamic, I go in to access for that database and add a third row. And save this. And hit refresh. We get the other one. Oops. We get the new row that I added. So it's retrieving it live. It's, it's creating that page at the moment that it's requested. It's going out to the database, retrieving the data, and forming that grid view, which again translates to an HTML table. All right. This is just, uh, just scratching the surface here. What we'll, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time working on this and doing all sorts of more involved SQL statements and more involved database design, and we'll continue on this example for, uh, for a few weeks, probably. Well, maybe to the end of the semester. I don't know. Um, so anyhow, we'll go and we'll do that. All right. Questions? Is it better to finish your database before you do implement it into the website, or does it really not matter because you can always make changes later? That's a good question. Um, general, that's a good question. Um, I can make arguments going either way. Um, in Especially one respect, because you'll never be finished making your data. Yeah, data. I was going to say, in one respect, I want to be finished designing it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, just so that I know nothing I'm going to do is going to drastically change. Yeah. As far as implementing it, once I have the design, then implementing it, yeah, implement it a piece at a time. Yeah. That's, that's probably a good, good strategy.